Hey all, have you ever had that experience after you play something really special that kind of leaves you at a loss for words, and then after beating it, you kind of just feel empty inside? Well, I had that experience kind of recently, and it was with no other game than... Deltarune is what you can call a spiritual successor to Undertale. Or depending on what fan theory you believe in, it might as well be connected as a multiverse thing. I recently played through Deltarune Chapter 1 and 2 here on YouTube, and it really left a mark on me. Deltarune wasn't just more Undertale, it was something completely different. In fact, it was so radically different from what I had imagined that I almost feel obligated to share my view of this game. And to do that, I want to take you through my journey with this game so far. So to make sense of the title of this video, Deltarune Hits Different, this is why. Alright, so right from the get-go, Deltarune opens up in a way more mysterious way than Undertale. But as soon as that ends, and you get past the fake-ass character creation segment, the game entirely switches its mood. Now taking place in a normal town, but strangely enough, the town is filled with reused Undertale characters. From there, we are introduced to our main character Chris with no apparent gender. It's here where we meet the new characters of the game for the first time, including the second main character of the game, Susie. Susie starts off as a typical bully, eating chalk and threatening to bite off Chris's face. You know, as you normally do. The two are tasked by the teacher to go get more chalk in the supply closet, but it's here where the game really begins. For some reason the whole closet is dark as hell and one thing leads to another and the pair falls down some dark void only to end up in the dark world. This is the point of the game where Undertale fans like me started to feel more at home. Everything looks so different and weird here, it creates quite the unique first impression. Fast forward a bit and Chris meets the third main character of the game, Ralsei, which explains the whole lore of this world. Or if you want to be technical, the legend of Delta Rune. That's two words for you. So the TLDR is that the balance of the light and dark world has been thrown off. And if this continues, the world is pretty much going to collapse upon itself. But three heroes, a human, a monster, and a prince from the dark, are said to appear and seal the multiple new dark fountains that's causing the imbalance in the first place. So that's the objective. Do as the legend says and save the world. That is until Susie straight up says no, going against destiny itself. I admire that somewhat, being so overly done with everything that you say no when there's a freaking legend about you. After Susie gives her answer, another new weird character shows up. The bad guy here is known as Lancer, actually. He's a total dumbass, but he is my dumbass. So already this game is a little more strange than Undertale, but this is all short-lived given that Lancer here initiates the first battle of the game. Oh, oh, this is one of the bigger changes when comparing Deltarune to Undertale. Looks-wise, this is far more traditional than the battle system of Undertale, given that there's actual party members and a much more straightforward visual representation of the characters you control. But that's just the surface level. It might not look like much more than a visual redesign, given that there's still only two real ways to deal with enemies, as before, sparing and killing them. So, what makes the difference? The answer is the multiple party member system. The addition of more than just one character makes all the difference in how battles are approached, be that in different strategies on how to attack or heal, and what to do with a certain character on their turn to maximize the turn's efficiency. This can be especially challenging when faced with harder enemies or certain bosses. So it's basically standard RPG stuff, but with the added twist of the spare kill system from Undertale. But that's not the end of it. The multiple party member system actually also impacts on how the story is being told. Given that there are multiple characters, stuff like character development is much more of a focus in Deltarune than it was in Undertale, whereas a lot of the characters really were stuck in their own zone of the game world. 
So given that we have these permanent party members that tag along for the entirety of the game so far, the story can develop itself in a more natural way. So going back to the story a little, Chris, Rolse, and eventually Susie all venture through this dark world in search of the first fountain. Aside from a few snags here and there, this first chapter is relatively linear, as the three completely forget about the shock they were supposed to get and continue their journey, they eventually befriend Lancer himself, who promptly locks them inside prison cells for their own safety from his father. After breaking out of jail, now's the time to head up and confront Lancer's father head on. So, just pausing here to make it clear, I'm not going to touch on every single part of the story for the sake of pacing, but I'll touch on some of the parts that stood out to me. Now, there's a lot of characters to talk to in the card castle. Some offer nothing at all of interest, while others drop subtle lore hints. However, in this castle is where we find one of the most interesting characters in the game so far. Shrouded in mystery, a devil by the name of Jevil resides in a special floor locked away from everyone else. Now, Jevil himself stands out from the rest of the characters in the game so far, given his incredibly hard fight and the mysterious reason for being locked away in the first place. So yeah, his fight is hard as balls and took me about an hour to beat. Still not nearly as hard as Sans, I think, but if you generally like the harder fights of Undertale, You'll love these just as much, if not more. Now, after beating Jevil, you get something called a Shadow Crystal. Now, you might be asking yourself, what the fuck is that? Eh. As of right now, the Shadow Crystal item itself doesn't do anything. However, as explained by the shopkeeper Seam, the Shadow Crystals are found with powerful enemies, and apparently the crystals are invisible, but still cast a shadow. So, feel free to speculate on the role these things are going to play in the later parts of the game, but personally, I think they aren't going to be much more than a means to unlock some hidden final boss at the final chapter of the game. But then again, Toby Fox is a rather creative man, so I might just be out of my mind here. Now, after dealing with Jevil, you eventually end up in the same spot as you would even if you ignored him. That means going up the card castle to face off against Lancer's father. The introduction to the Chaos King himself is rather cruel. At first I couldn't really believe what was going on, but I quickly noticed the tone itself was getting oddly serious. And really, while talking about the serious nature of this fight, Deltarune itself feels way more serious all things considered than Undertale ever did. And you know, I really like that. While there are aspects of comedic relief in both games, what resonates with me is the deep character interaction aspect of it, and I want to believe that it is like that for the majority of people. A fight later and here we are at the first Dark Fountain. Now this was a huge moment for me, a clear tone shift again, yet only this time it felt more surreal, as Susie says. It feels like we've stumbled into something really important. It's here where I want to emphasize the music of the moment as well. It reminds me a lot of those otherworldly Pokemon Mystery Dungeon themes, yet what follows is a triumphant nod to Undertale. Strange. It was as if your very soul was glowing. Ooh. <laughs> oh wow. Straight up Undertale. The moment is over in about 10 seconds, all things considered, but that doesn't matter in all honesty. What does matter is the emotional aspect, not only as a connection to Undertale for longtime fans, but the smart use of the instruments and visuals make the scene leave an impact on me. So sure enough, after finishing up at the fountain, Susie and Chris are both transported back into the normal world, this time in an old classroom next to the supply closet. It's here you'll notice all of the stuff laying around the room is pretty much smaller versions of what you encountered in the Dark World. This in itself raises questions about what the Dark World even is or was. But for now, the game opens up somewhat, allowing you to explore the town. And while there's a lot of people to talk to and see, no one is as interesting to me, at least other than Noel's dad. Yeah, that ain't no lie. 
Given the role Noel plays in chapter 2, and most likely will even further on, the, the focus here on her sick dad is what I presume to be some kind of setup for something much bigger. Given that when you ask him about the sickness he has, he answers just as a typical parent would when talking to a young child, basically dodging the question. As far as I'm concerned, I would assume him to have some sort of tumor growing, given that he specifically says they found something. But for now, I can't be too sure just yet. And if you walk around the town a little more, you can actually find the lovable skeleton, Sans, just chilling. As you greet him, you get two options on what to say, one of which is, great to see you again. So, as far as I've seen, most people think this outright confirms the common theory of Sans being some kind of traveling entity that jumped in from the Undertale world. I'm a bit skeptical on that, though. Personally, I think Sans being here is cool and all, but I doubt Toby would use him again for any serious storytelling given that he has so many other new characters to use in Deltarune. Eventually, after talking to as many people as you want, head home and get to bed to end chapter 1. This is the first time Deltarune made me feel confused. It all starts with this scene. I'm not controlling this at all. Hello? Holy shit, dude. What the fuck? Just ripping out of your heart. Without any at all. Blood or anything. Oh, into the cage you go. And a sword. Or something. Now, aside from questioning how one can rip out their own heart and throw it in a cage, and somehow still be alive, this scene raises some questions. Most people online say this is a representation of Chris, the character taking control, back from the player. I buy that, sure. But what I don't understand as of right now is why that would result in Chris acting all evil, like with the knife and the grim look on their face. Truly perplexing stuff, I know. What follows is the end credits of chapter 1, accompanied by a frankly beautiful song. As I watched the end credits roll by, I couldn't help but feel myself being drawn into this world, and the emotions I felt at that point was something akin to nostalgia and excitement for what was about to happen next. So in short, the ending sequence was very nice. It's at this point between chapter 1 and 2 where I feel as if the real game begins. I mean, the world wasn't gonna save itself now, was it? Chapter 1 is a superb start and releases the tone of what's to come. So, what does Chapter 2 have in store? Chapter 2 expands upon pretty much everything from Chapter 1, and as I said, is the point where I feel the real game begins. The story itself pretty much picks up exactly after chapter 1. Chris wakes up and goes to school once more. Susie and Chris decide to head back into the dark world after class to make sure what they experienced was real. Noelle quickly stops the pair and gives Susie a little gift, a lunchbox full of chalk, then proceeding to run away all embarrassed. Upon my first time playing, I didn't think much of this scene. I'd much rather move on to see the dark world again. But later on, this is a clear setup for the feelings Noelle is developing, showing that she noticed and knew about Susie's habits and interests. 
After entering the Dark World again, Ralsei then tells Chris to turn right back around and go out and get all the stuff from the old classroom east of the closet doors and to take all of that stuff back into the Dark World. After somehow smashing everything into a ball and carrying it back, the ball of stuff transforms into all of the characters from chapter 1. So just like that, we're back in business. One of the bigger questions I was left with after playing this section is how the hell would Rolsey know about where specifically they are located in a school and where exactly to look for the stuff from chapter 1? The answer can of course just be, it's a game. Don't think about it. But Toby being Toby, I suspect there's more to this. Shortly after checking the town and all, Chris and Susie leave the town in order to do their homework. Lancer and Rules join in on the fun by climbing into Chris's pockets, somehow becoming key items. Chris and Susie decide to head to the local library to do their homework, but end up stumbling into the next Dark World portal when they try and enter the computer lab. So this is pretty much the second world of this game, and oh boy does it deliver. This is the cyber world, basically a distorted cyberpunk-ish world, Pretty much everything here is some kind of joke on either electrical equipment or online memes. And since I'm a huge tech nerd, this was awesome to see. Not long into their exploration, the group runs into the main villain of this place. Q5U4EX7. Fuck that. Queen here is a bit of a meme-worthy character, boasting a stupidly catchy theme that I swear I've heard somewhere before. Maybe it's just my imagination. So what essentially is going on is that Queen here is the ruler of this place, and ends up capturing Noelle, who also made her way into this version of the Dark World. Ralsei somehow shows up, not sure how he made his way here, but oh well. Not long into the exploration of the cyber world, the gang runs into Queen again, and this time you end up fighting her in a little arcade punch-out game. This was somewhat interesting for me given my retro gaming knowledge, but also because of the way this stood out from everything else so far. And sure enough, this little arcade game actually holds a lot of importance towards the end of chapter 2. So that's some nice foreshadowing if nothing else. Fast forward a bit and you fight these musical dance dudes. Sweet cap and cakes for you diehard fans who get way too angry if I don't mention their actual names. And these guys reveal that apparently Queen herself used to be nice and all before the Dark Fountain showed up. And there's not much to go on other than that, but to me that signals that the Dark Fountain itself seems to corrupt the people around it. Basically akin to a drug addiction, where the drug, in this case the fountain, corrupts the mind. I'm sure there's some actual character causing these things to appear in the first place, but nothing is known about that so far at least. Stuff like this is what I love in gaming so much, getting just enough information for the mystery to be interesting, but not enough to outright give the answers away. A while later, the gang once again runs into Queen and her unique dialogue. Queen surprises everyone by revealing that Noelle seemingly has joined her side of world domination, but she's ultimately too useless to do anything in front of Susie. Shocker, am I right? So, here instead comes the second best character in the entire game. B B Birdly! He's a complete dork that very obviously is just going along with this to get with Noel. So, I mean, respect for the determination, if nothing else. After a short fight with Birdly on these roller coasters and some banter from Queen, the gang falls into the trash pit, also known as TikTok. The gang eventually splits up to find Noelle with Susie and Ralsei going on their own and Chris all alone. So this is essentially the first time I was set back to the Undertale kind of gameplay. Not for long though since after a comedic interaction with Noelle, Queen and even Birdly, it's revealed Noelle actually doesn't want to be with Queen, preferring to team up with Chris instead. What follows is a lot of puzzles for once and some slow character building. It's here where Noelle really grows on me. Her personality and curiosity shines in stark contrast to the rest of the characters so far. And that goes for more than just dialogue. She's noticeably afraid and not accustomed to fighting, as seen in her expressive sprites, even going so far as to sigh of relief after a battle's end. And I really like that. 
she comes up as more relatable and realistic than a lot of other characters. And to me, she is definitely one of my favorites so far. I think this is the part of the game where the lore gets dialed up a notch. You got a bunch of characters all around that say some pretty interesting stuff. And it's even here with Noel that Deltarune's genocide route, or Snowgrave route as it's more commonly called, becomes available. I did end up doing both routes on my playthrough of Deltarune, and I think that's ideally what you should do if you're playing this for the first time too. After another fight with Birdly claiming that Chris is forcing Noel to be with him, which might not be entirely false if you're playing the Snowgrave route, the pair runs into Queen once more, and after a little driving minigame and listening to the funky mixtape that Queen has, Chris alone needs to solve a traffic jam. Like what? And finally, this is the part of the game where we are introduced to the absolute best character Toby Fox has ever created. Ladies and gentlemen, and everything in between, this is the big shot himself. Spamton here is an odd guy with a lot of mystery surrounding him. At first he seems to be nothing more than, well, spam. But as he keeps on talking, it's evidently clear that there's something deeper that he has hidden inside his little head. Spamton here is apparently some kind of salesman and is repeatedly trying to sell you a deal. His goal at this point seems to be to get a hold of your heart-shaped object, which I can only assume to be the soul of Chris. Or... If you're really stretching it, it could be the same heart that we saw Chris throw at the end of chapter 1. In any case, Spamton fights you and aside from having a fire battle theme, he goes down pretty quickly. Only after the fight does he then tell Chris to come meet him at his garbage shop at the beginning of the trash pit area. One of the most standout features of Spamton's mention is his way of speech. He speaks as you would guess as a typical spam mail, including loads of weird random words and phrases, as well as the all-too-perfect <gasps> hyperlink blocked. A car explosion later, Susan rolls a finally meet up with Chris and Noel. Flash forward a bit to Noel getting captured by Queen and the rest, including Birdly, getting captured as well in specialized rooms of Queen's mansion. So just as in Chapter 1, Chapter 2 also has its finale in a huge dungeon place, Hoping that's a little different for chapter 3, but oh well. While inside the mansion, I decided to get some new stuff from the local store before heading off to the trash pit once more to visit good old Spamton. Spamton informed me of a special deal of his. A supposed workout ready body hiding deep underground in the Queen's mansion. Spammy boy here goes absolutely crazy telling you how much he wants the body for himself. Occasionally, though, as you continue talking to the spam man, he lets out more lore hints about himself, referencing someone known as Mike that's seemingly trying to communicate through Spamton himself. Spooky stuff, I know. The track through the Queen Mansion is just like any other huge RPG dungeon. It's filled with enemies pretty much all over the place, puzzles, and some mysteries. As I progressed, I eventually found my way to the basement floor, which immediately hit me with a huge tone shift. Something was up, and I just walked right into it. I end up getting an empty disc from some beat-down body hanging from a few wires on a wall. So needless to say, I fulfilled Spam Boy's request. Or so I thought. Spam Boy uploads his consciousness to the disc somehow, and now the mission is to put it back in the body in the basement so I'm pretty sure everyone can see where this is leading to. Putting in the disc does nothing. Wait, what? That is until you leave the room and try to walk away. Uh-oh. Ahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahah
So either he was a massive pushover, or I just have gotten better at games. Spamton ended up giving me the second Shadow Crystal of the game, and just as before it, it doesn't do anything just yet. Now, pretty much the rest of Chapter 2 is a linear shot towards the end, with some encounters along the way. One of the more notable ones being Noelle and Susie going on a ferris wheel together after being rescued. Up at the very top of the mansion, Queen awaits, and to no one's surprise, has caught Birdly again. So, once and for all, let's beat Queen. Oh, oh no. What is this catchy song? Now, I won't lie, I found this fight somewhat easy, especially after Spamton, but sure enough, Queen has some cool moves here and there, and after freeing Birdly, Queen decides the best course of action is to skedaddle away. So here we are, the final boss of Chapter 2, Giga Queen. This is what that arcade fight from the beginning of the chapter was leading up to. Here you cannot spare her, and thus a punch-out-like battle is forced to commence. This fight is unlike anything in both Undertale and Deltarune, and as such is a very nice standout part of these games. Personally, I really love this fight. The music is all Sega Genesis-like, and the gameplay is different yet fits in super well. After the fight, Birdly suggests opening up a new dark portal after Noelle and Susie both talk about how much they prefer living in the dark world. Ralsei stops them both with some much needed lore. So apparently opening up some more fountains would cause some titans to wake up and actually just straight up destroy the world. So long story short, that's pretty bad. What follows is a comedic scene that it's a little hard to grasp in my opinion. Suddenly everyone is like friends and whatnot. Oh well, you know the deal, Chris and Susie head toward the fountain. And as before, it feels just as momentous this time. I suppose even more now, given how much happens in Chapter 2. One more time, Chris steps forward and seals the fountain. But before being done with Chapter 2, you once more get to roam the overworld and to talk to more NPCs. Just as before, I found Noelle's dad to be the most interesting one, given his declining health. For now, Noelle and Birdly try to convince themselves that this was all a dream, although deep down they know it wasn't. As I was walking in the overworld, I couldn't help but wonder, what could possibly happen going forward? It feels like we've climaxed already, so I mean, what could possibly happen going forward in Chapter 3? Chris and Susie end up going to Chris's home and spend the night there while watching movies together. But as before, Chris has an episode. Chris somehow again removes that same heart as before, throws it away only to jump out the window and slice up Toriel's car wheels. Then later on, this happens. Dude, I am confused beyond anything. What is that? Is that the knife? Oh, what the hell? Oh, actually, you might be correct in it being a TV thing. Did, I, did Chris just open a dark portal here? Chris once again sets up an even bigger mystery for the path forward. As the TV lights up with that sickening smile, I cannot help but wonder if it has any connection to that same mic that communicated through Spamton. And that's a wrap on Chapter 2. Deltarune has so far impressed me extraordinarily, going above and beyond what Undertale ever did for me. I suppose a big factor in why is the heavier focus on an interconnected story with more reoccurring characters and lore bits. And this is me not even mentioning all of the dialogue and actual events that happen as you play the game. For crying out loud, there's a full different scenario in Chapter 2 if you do the Snowgrave route, and even something like that has a huge impact on the story. However, as this video is getting a little longer than I really want it to be, I'll save my thoughts for the Snowgrave route for a later time. Deltarune has made me think, reflect, and straight up feel more from a game than anything else has in a long while. Deltarune came into my life as something completely different from what I've experienced. The gameplay and story structure is so uniquely Toby Fox, it's hard to find something that comes close to replicating it, other than maybe the original Mother series of games, which was the main inspiration for Undertale in the first place. Deltarune really seems to resonate with a lot of people online. 
judging from YouTube comments, Reddit communities, other forums, etc. Pretty much everyone I see talking about this game seems to share my view of it being kinda nostalgic in a way. And to me that feels more comforting than anything. That pretty much everyone, no matter where you are from, can agree that this game is truly something special. And I cannot wait to see what comes next. So now that you know my journey with Deltarune, is there anything you relate to if you've played the game yourself? If so, let me know. As the title says, for me, Deltarune hit different. Thanks for watching this whole thing. If you have a moment to spare, then consider subscribing to the channel and to like this video to help me grow and create more stuff like this.